the economic consequences of that are so enormous that I don't think I need to belabor the point. So what we saw is that a biopsychosocial and trauma-oriented approach to medical care is feasible, affordable, and acceptable, that it may be possible to rescue primary care from its current symptom-reactive mode of practice to start dealing with basic causes and thereby reduce the social burden of medical care costs, and that this novel concept of preventive medicine is proposed as the standard mechanism for entry into all ongoing medical care. If you ask what can we do in the near future, well, I would say the reality is the only thing that would be affordable is going to be primary prevention to try to figure out how to reduce the very occurrence of the determinants of risk factors rather than to try to deal with the diseases after the fact or the risk factors themselves after they've been established. How to do that? No one knows. But some things come to mind. Universal parenting programs, home visitation programs for newborns for the first couple of years of life. And here's an interesting thought. The therapeutic educational use of soap opera. I kid you not. We ran for three years a home visitation program involving 700 newborns. And the one thing that was the constant was that the TV was always on during the home visits, and it was always on to soap operas. And it got me seriously thinking about the role of soap opera, you know, which is usually dismissed as you know, entertainment, distraction, etc. I think not. I think it really has the role the theater has had back to the time of the ancient Greeks, namely a device to help people speak about the otherwise unspeakable. It may be hard to talk with my friends about the way I feel when my husband's sleeping with a neighbor or my kid's gay or on drugs. But did you see, did you see what's happening in the show today? The potential of this is enormous. It has been used successfully in, of all places, South America and Africa. The potential for soap opera to be an unconscious educational teaching device to illustrate how destructive parenting looks like and how it plays out over time is something to keep in mind. Secondary prevention, yeah, to put programs together for high-risk or imprisoned parents, creation of an internet-based medical history that would provide in-depth, in-breadth information in a standardized format to physicians. Tertiary prevention, what we're doing now, I mean, it's, it's important. You learn a lot from attempting it. It's an act of kindness. It will never deal, it will never begin to approach dealing with the magnitude of the problem. Medical school involvement may be here. I don't know. Certainly not in the United States. Final insights. Adverse childhood experiences are common, typically unrecognized. Their link to major problems later in life is strong, graded, and logical. It makes sense why people smoke, drink, are intractable eaters, become promiscuous, buy street drugs. It makes sense. Adverse childhood experiences are the nation's most basic public health problem. We came to see that it's comforting to mistake intermediary mechanism for basic cause. That what presents as the problem may in fact be someone's attempt at solution. And that treating the solution may be threatening and cause people to flee from treatment. And that primary prevention is presently the only feasible population approach and lastly, that the resistance to introducing these changes is major, as we have seen.
If you would like further information about the ACE study, there's a very good documentary motion picture that's been made and also a, a, a DVD of a lengthy presentation that's, that's quite inexpensively available. I, I, I thank you for inviting me here.